Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation um, to talk about PFOs again. I'm always happy to do this. Um, let's see, where's the next slide here? Thank you. So I've given this talk, um, or portions of this, to cardiology groups. I'm often asked to give the, neuro the neurologist perspective, but it's uh, quite important that you recognize this is mine and not all of our perspectives. Um, I have worked with Abbott on the RESPECT trial. So this is a timeline, might be a little hard to see the details, but it basically goes back um, 20 years or so, um, the beginning of the uh, thinking of how to treat patients with uh, presumed PFO-related uh, strokes. Uh, there are a bunch of um, classification systems up here that I'll touch on at the end. These are all the trials coming through the uh, mid uh, to late tens. Um, here we are at the end of the decade, um, and we finally have two PFO occluder devices available. Um, for secondary stroke prevention. I'm not going to go through the six um, clinical trials in detail. I'm happy to discuss them. Um, but uh, just to say that there is now a more or less um, emerging consensus um, that closure uh, is preferential uh, for the prevention of recurrent stroke in patients who've already had a stroke that are thought to be due to the PFO. Um, and the treatment effect uh, is about a 70% relative reduction. Um, if you put all the studies together, they vary a little bit, but for the most part, uh, that's kind of where we are. Uh, yeah, so that's the hazard ratio. I'm only going to make three observations today. Obviously, I can't talk about all of the data and all the future research still to do, so I'm going to make three observations. One is an observation about the treatment effect size. Number two is I'm, I, there, I'm concerned about the gossip about PFO subgroups, and people seem to think they know who are the right patients to close and who are the right patients from whom closure should be withheld. Um, and I just want to give you my um, thoughts on that. And then finally, a brief um, a comment about uh, PFO stroke nomenclature. So why isn't closure 100% effective? That's the question. I mean, if you think somebody's had a PFO-related stroke and you close the PFO, you shouldn't have any more of those strokes again. The problem is largely because stroke is not a disease. I don't have to tell this sophisticated audience that it's the end point of a heterogeneous collection of many other disorders. And it might be 100% uh, effective for PFO-related recurrences, but um, it, might, it clearly can't affect carotid dissections and carotid disease and small vessel disease uh, and AFib and various other things. So um, what kind of treatment effect should we expect? Well, when we started the trials, um, I think the thinking, it wasn't clearly articulated like this, but I think this is what people were generally thinking, which is that we're going to study trials in patients who had a PFO-related index stroke. And the recurrent strokes are all going to be PFO-related. Um, and if numbers one and two aren't completely true, then anyway, the recurrent strokes will be the same mechanism as the index stroke, if it, say, wasn't PFO-related. And if one or two and three aren't true, then at least the crossover between the mechanisms will be at about the same rate. Let me um, show you what I mean by that. So you start out with a bunch of patients. You think they have a PFO-related index stroke, um, and then they have a PFO-related recurrence. That's what we, we kind of thought we were doing. But in the uh, population of index strokes, there are going to be some that are not PFO-related. Their recurrent strokes also can be not PFO-related, and PFO closure is not going to have any impact on that. The problem is more complicated, though, because it's possible that somebody who comes into the trial with a PFO-related stroke can get out of the trial with a non-PFO-related recurrence, and vice versa. And the way I've put it uh, uh, pictorially here is the rate is pretty much the same, but it's probably true that non-PFO related strokes have a higher recurrence rate. So what should we expect from this complicated setup from an intervention which is aimed solely at preventing one of these stroke mechanisms, which is PFO related recurrence? Well, here's the um, ideal circumstance. Everybody has a PFO related stroke. Everybody has a PFO related recurrence. If you treat with uh, PFO closure, um, with a closure device, there should be zero recurrences for a 100% relative risk reduction. That's great. That's what we might have expected. But like I said, we saw about a 70% relative risk reduction um, in all of the trials. Um, just a brief backup about the ROPE study. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it allows us to. Um, give a probability for an individual patient um, for what the likelihood of their discovered PFO is 
for their index stroke. Um, the problem is, if you have a population of cryptogenic stroke patients, prevalence of PFO is higher than the general population here, let's say 40%. If the background prevalence is 25%, I'm not going to go through the math, but it turns out that about half of all of the PFO, uh, PFOs that are discovered are in fact incidental. And the other half are the pathogenic ones. And those are the ones that we particularly are interested um, in knowing about. And so how do we disentangle those pink boxes from each other? That's what the ROPE uh, score was designed to do. Again, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but what the ROPE score successfully does in a population of cryptogenic stroke patients is predict the prevalence of PFO amongst ROPE strata. So the lowest ROPE score patients are the oldest ones with lots of vascular risk factors and a deep infarct. Um, and the prevalence of PFO amongst low ROPE scores are roughly the general population. And when you get to a high ROPE score, um, the prevalence is way too high. And so clearly, those patients are more likely to have had a PFO-related index stroke. Uh, I'm not going to go into this for um, time reasons. But so it turns out that in the uh, randomized trials, at least in the first two and a half that we've looked at um, uh, trials, the uh, average ROPE score is probably around seven which means that the PFO attributable fraction or the likelihood that the index stroke was PFO related within the population is probably about 72%. So here are the PFO related strokes in these studied patients in the clinical trials um, uh, statistically, and these are the PFO unrelated strokes in patients who had cryptogenic stroke with PFO. And the recurrences, if they were about the same, uh, would look something like this. You do PFO closure, every single one of these would be obliterated because this is a 100% um, perfect treatment, let's say, then the uh, relative risk reduction that you might observe would be about 72%. Um, now, look at these yellow boxes for a second, because I think the non-PFO-related re recurrences are a little more likely to recur, and so therefore, we're going to modify that treatment effect a little bit, so it's something less than 72%. I don't know how much, but it's curious that this is, in fact, what was observed in the um, uh, clinical trials. Now, if you, uh, th this comes from an individual patient data meta analysis uh, version one that was done on the first two and a half um, randomized trials that we had available to us. Um, and we dichotomized them by ROPE score. This was presented but not yet published um, at a stroke meeting. And it seems like there is a differential treatment effect based on ROPE score. So the higher ROPE score patients seem to have a greater treatment effect. Um, but this was not statistically significant, probably because of numbers. Now, here is something that I haven't shown before. This hasn't been published. But this is, uh, again, the, from the individual patient data meta-analysis. This is the um, attributable fraction by ROPE score. And then when we look at the treatment effect by ROPE score, it almost perfectly matches it. It's not completely perfect, and there's a negative number here, which I think is not harm, but probably just low numbers. Um, but it seems like those who patients who have the highest ROPE scores, therefore more likely to have PFO-related index events are the ones that most uh, likely benefit. Um, and the good news is that uh, the individual patient data meta-analysis funding has just come through in the last month or so, and so we're going to start again with all six of the randomized trials, and we'll have a much better handle on uh, treatment effects, which c brings me to the subgroups. I only have a few minutes left, but I don't need much. Um, everybody knows that the large shunts and those with atrial septal aneurysms are the high-risk ones, and everybody know th everyone knows that because it just makes sense. And the subgroups, in any case, in the randomized trials showed a differential treatment effect. And those trials that had the high-risk PFOs had the greatest treatment effect. I think all of that is mistaken. I think the FDA got it right when they uh, did their label for the PFO closure device. What did they say, uh, say about subgroups? Um, nothing. <laughs> Um, and I think that's important. The people who are trying to advocate for knowing who the subgroups are that have a differential treatment effect, look at the RESPECT trial data and look at the shunt size and atrial septal aneurysms that seem to have a, um, a preferential, uh, a greater treatment effect. Um, and these were statistically significant for interaction. But the problem is, if you have an atrial septal aneurysm in a different trial, uh, the treatment effect seems to go the other direction, which is complicated. Um, People have also, I'm going to 
skip over this one. People have also looked at the reduced trial um, data and said, look, if you have a large, a large shunt, um, there's a significant effect. Look, you can see the um, p-value is 0.01. And if you have a small shunt, the p-value is 0.26. It crosses the line here. And so therefore, we know it's the large shunts that have to be treated. The problem with that is that um, there's no uh, interaction term which is even approaching significant. And if you want to live by these almost identical point estimates and these differential error bars, you'll have to never again treat a um, female because the same uh, picture holds there. So, um, uh, and then people have pointed to these uh, other trials which were much smaller that had um, different inclusion criteria and said the treatment effect is so big that those are the ones that we know we have to treat. Um, so it just makes sense is one argument. Uh, so did bloodletting at one point. Subgroups show differential treatment effects, and I would say that's not consistent. Um, and the more restrictive trials had a greater treatment effect. I would say it's kind of risky to compare treatment effects across trials. So it's fine if you say, I'm only going to treat large shunts uh, and those with atrial septal aneurysms, but you have to accept that the uh, flip side of that is that you're not going to treat small shunts without an atrial septal aneurysm, and we don't yet know that that's right. My final comment about nomenclature is this cryptogenic stroke with PFO business. Is that really the best that we can do? Would you be comfortable saying, oh, yes, this patient has cryptogenic stroke with atrial fibrillation? That just kind of sounds foolish. You have to come to some conclusion about what you think your stroke uh, patient actually had. The stroke classification systems, for the most part, so this is um, TOAST and CCS and ASCOD, for the most part predate a lot of these PFO data um, when it was less clear. Um, and uh, the FDA refers to cryptogenic stroke due to presumed paradoxical embolism. They don't tell us how to presume it. Um, I'd just like to give you a heads up that there is a working group trying to come up with a way to define PFO probable and possible, uh, PFO associated strokes that are probable and possible. Um, hopefully we'll get that out um, and we'll have a better handle on how to refer to these. Um, so here's PFO associated stroke, might be coming uh, soon. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over this and just show you, uh, I'm sorry, I'm out of my time. So I'm going to skip over this. Lots of outstanding issues. Uh, take a picture if you want to see what I think are uh, outstanding. And now a pretty picture. Thank you very much. <laughs>